Finally, that fool Korg has been defeated. Yes, he was a tough one to crack. But looks like we finally overwhelmed him. Now he'll never make another video again. And we can- Oh, you all didn't happen to be talking about me, did you? What? You sacrificed yourself to create us. How are you alive? My death was greatly exaggerated. Now, who wants another D&D lineages video? <laughs> Hello there, Traveler. My name is Korg the Mighty, here with the Nerdy Guide to D&D. On this channel, we've posted a lot about the D&D lineages. However, if you're a new player, you might still be wondering, well, all that info is great, but I'm still unsure which lineage would be good for me. And that's why I'm here. Why else would I be here? I do as the Raven Queen commands. Thus, today we'll be talking about five options that are typically great for new players when it comes to lineages, and five that you might want to avoid until you got a couple more characters under your belt. And as always, take this with a pinch of salt the size of Kansas. Now first, what classifies a lineage as being great? How can we you know, judge that. Well, I believe that it primarily comes down to a balance between two things. First, simplicity. There are several lineages out there that might be fun to play, but can take a fair amount of fine tuning and upkeep in order to reach the full extent of that fun. And when you're a new player and you're already being bombarded with a horde's worth of new terms and concepts, Having a lineage that's easier to understand can be pretty helpful. Second, their traits are still fun. While there are also a ton of lineages that are essentially plug and play, they're so simple, they can get a bit boring at times, at least from a gameplay perspective. The lineages of D&D can offer such a wide myriad of options that going with something like a human, while indeed easy to play, can leave you missing out on some really cool mechanics. So in my mind, a lineage is considered great if it hits a balance between those two, having fun, creative, unique traits that don't take Albert Einstein to understand. Without further ado, let's run down the list. And while we're going through these, let us know down in the comments which ones you thought were going to be on here and which ones you didn't expect. Starting off the list of good lineages, we have the OG Flyboys themselves, the Aarakocra. Now, some people might disagree and say that flight is not a tool to give new players, especially if there's going to be a lot of combat involved. However, I'd reckon it's a mechanic that people should be allowed to explore early on. It can be used for both roleplay and combat purposes. The theater of the mind aspect isn't too difficult. And also, I'm the one with a degree in D&D lineage, don't test me. Beyond their flight, their talons also give you an alternative combat method, which you may not end up using much, but nice to have, and you get an extra spell. Essentially, if you're looking to play as an overgrown mutated chicken wing, this is the place to- no, no, the other one. Thank you. Number two is elves. Now, elves are on this list for kind of a weird reason. They themselves are simple, what with their trance and fey ancestry, but in their base form, elves aren't really that super interesting, uh, especially when talking about their traits. Now you can delve into an eternal library's worth of lore for them, but typically I usually see elves being used as a jumping off point for players to eventually experiment with more unique varieties of elf, like the Shatter Kai or the Eladrin. Beautiful. Now, if you like playing elves, this is not meant to be any disrespect towards you. You are perfectly valid for whatever lineage you want to play. That being said, for new players, I typically recommend they start with a basic elf or one of its other variants, like a like a wood elf or a high elf or even a dark elf for some extra spice. And then use that to graduate to more potent options. If you're a cottagecore player looking for something to fit your personality, then in coming in at number three, we have the Fear Bulg. And no, the order of these lineages is not meant to indicate that one is better than the other, they just happen to be organized alphabetically. Now, starting off, their ability to talk to plants and animals is already fun enough. Assuming, you know, you're in a place where you can do that. Screw you, Shadowfell, the Fear Bulg are not your friend. If nothing else, it's a cute detail that players can experiment with, and sometimes that's all you need. And you can't deny the appeal of literally being able to communicate and make friends with your entire trove of houseplants. Couple that with an ability to turn invisible, a couple spells, and the fact that you are big, 
and they can be a lot of fun. But what if your campaign is super combat focused? Well, the half orc is here for you. Now, to be honest, I was torn between a lot of options for this slot, the combat focused slot, specifically this or the Dragonborn. However, I think half-orcs have the Dragonborn beat in a couple ways. Number one, half-orcs are typically less situational than Dragonborns, with a Dragonborn's resistance sometimes getting used less than empathy in a Hasbro boardroom. Additionally, people can roll saves on a Dragonborn's breath attack, meaning it's still cool up here, but not as cool here. Beyond that, a half-orc can be very new player friendly, with their relentless endurance preventing new players from getting immediately one-shot, and savage attacks making their crits feel that just much more satisfying, adding a, like, tailwind to their combat. A very screamy tailwind, but a tailwind nonetheless. Hey, but half-orcs don't even have tails. Shut up, disembodied voice in my room. And last but not least, we have the Satyrs. Much like the Fearbolg, they're typically just fun to play. They got ramming and magical resistance for combat. They got reveler for roleplay. And they got mirthful leaps for making Superman feel inadequate. Now here's the thing, a little seed that I want to try and plant in people's minds. I typically see Satyrs associated with bards due to their affinity for performance and the extra instrument they get. But come here, come here. A bard ain't the only class that requires charisma. Imagine a satyr warlock. Satyr cult, satyr cult, satyr cult, say- I'm pretty sure that's just cult of the Shut lamb. Up. Wait, you have a point. Uh, before we move on to the other five lineages, I want to give a quick honorable mention to the Simic hybrids. Yeah, sure, they're a bit weird to look at. Sure, they don't unlock their full potential until level five, which some new players won't reach on their first campaign. But you can build them like Legos. I want to see my crab boy scaling up a wall like Spider-Man, giving J. Jonah Jameson just another reason to pop a blood vessel. All right, so taking a look at the five lineages that I don't recommend to new players, I have now realized that three of them are from the same book, Spelljammer, the space book, which kind of makes sense. WotC has been releasing lineages for so long that it's not really a surprise that some of their later iterations have become more complex in order to keep them fresh. But as a result, they can also scare off new players. The three lineages in question are the Autonomes, the GIF, and I'm sorry to say it, the plasmoids. I know, I know, I hype them up so much in the other videos, but if I'm being honest, the way that they are typically played, at least rules as written, I found can often leave players a bit confused and a bit frustrated at some points. For example, as a plasmoid, you're indeed able to squeeze into almost any area you want. However, the rules specify that you can't be carrying or holding anything when you do this, which is not a stipulation that most lineages have to deal with, but you would. Additionally, you have to constantly be aware of what form you are taking because plasmoids don't typically assume a humanoid form. They're typically a blob and you have to delineate what specific form you want to take and remember that throughout the campaign. Add in things like your pseudopod and you might start to see why some players can find them a bit awkward to use. Autonomes, on the other hand, aren't necessarily awkward. They just have so much shit. They have six, count them, six unique traits, and those can delineate into other sub-traits, and that's before you've selected your class and your backstory, and it's just a wave of information. Then we have the GIF, and just don't? Now's a perfect time to repeat that anything that I say is not gospel. You can feel free to play whatever you want as long as your DM is cool with it and you think it would be fun to try. But the GIF... They're just a special breed, and it mostly has to do with their firearms mastery. Now, firearms in D&D are typically not something that I recommend giving to new players. In fact, your campaign setting might not have them at all. And firearms are a big part of the gift's deal. You know, besides the psychic Super Saiyan punches. Beyond that, mostly guns. So yeah, 
best to typically avoid until you know more of what you're doing. In terms of the last two lineages, we have one that I think a lot of people might have seen coming, and that is the Halfling. This is mostly due to their lucky trait, which in my eyes potentially cuts out a crucial part of the D&D experience, that being rolling nat ones. Quick recap from the first lineages video, Halflings essentially have a trait that makes it really, 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 really hard for them to roll nat ones sometimes. And rolling nat ones in this game, it's... It's like a ritual that you got you gotta undertake in order to join like a secret club or something. It's not going to be enjoyable, especially the first couple go arounds, and it might crop up at some of the worst moments. But in my mind, that's how it helps build the story. A nat one can sometimes leave a player at their lowest, but if they are able to surmount that, oh my gosh, it's such a good story moment. Also, it could just it, it could just be funny. And if you play a basic halfling, you're cutting out a major part of that. Like I've said previously, your DM might not even let you play halfling as it's written. But even if they do, this is just my two cents on why it shouldn't be your first go-to pick. Finally, it pains my heart to say this, but the Kenku. For those who don't remember, the Kenku's whole deal is essentially being a living soundboard. They can repeat pretty much any noise and replicate any voice they've ever heard, which for experience our peers can sound, see what I did there, like a really fun tool. But for people who are new to D&D, new to role playing even, I can say from experience that some new players can find difficulty in figuring out how to use and when to use this trait. It's something that takes a little bit of finagling and planning and somebody's brain might just not be configured for that yet, which is completely fine. I have yet to see somebody play a Kenku with an actual soundboard though, but that would be hilarious. And there you have it, Traveler. My recommendations for some great and not so great lineages for new DMD players. If you're about to create your first character or you're looking for a new lineage to try out or a DM looking for help with a new player, hopefully this helped. If you enjoyed the video, do all the YouTube things. Cast Eldritch Blast right on that subscribe button or the like button or the saved playlist. But I don't know. I hope you have a fantastic, toptastic day. This is Cork the Mighty, signing off for a nerdy guide to D&D.